Okay, this will be part three, or we're going to start it off right. Go! That'll work. <laughs> I went into a second note there without the one. <laughs> Isaiah 25. Verse 1. Let's just jump right in. We're going to say that again. Yahweh Helohiata. Aromameka Oda Shemka Ki Ashit Fele Azot Merechok Amona Amen. Yahweh, you are my Elohim. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name. For you have done wondrously. Your plans from the distant past were kept with firm faithfulness. So here we are, part three of zeroing in on Isaiah 29. So we're going to pick up where we left off, which is verse 16. And in the regular Stones to Knock reading, it says, Shall your contrariness be considered like the potter's clay? Or can a product say of its master, he didn't make me? Okay, but this is where my take on how to translate this is, so you reverse it then. Reverse what? Well, just to pick up where we left off on the other one, let's back up to verse 15. The word is spelled hevav yod. It's oi! It's What? The depth, the incredible deep study, the profundity of Yahweh, the thing that was hidden is the backbone of wise counsel understanding the resurrection. And the reason I say that is the word is ayan zadi, and I believe in this verse 15 it's ayan zadi hey. Uh, well, I don't, where is it? Wrong, wrong letters. Um, ayan zadi hey. So let me tell you where I get this. Ayanzadi, hey, Ayanzadi is the word to close the eyes or to take counsel, which is to say open the eyes. It's also to lignify, which is to make into wood. So to turn something into stone is petrify. To turn something into wood is lignify. So Ayanzadi, hey, is to turn something into wood. Similar to petrify, but it's that's just what the word means. However, Ayan Zadi Mem, Mem can be a plural suffix. But Ayan Zadi Mem means to turn something into something hard like bone or to make it solid, no longer flexible and resilient, like getting a cataract over your eye. And it can mean backbone. So, for me to take those words and realize, okay, that there's an ayan, zadi, etz, which is the word for tree, but pezadi is open mouth. So, if pezadi is open mouth, and pe is a mouth, the letter that means mouth, and ayan zadi, is, ayan is the letter that means eye, then ayan zadi can mean to open the eye. So to take Yahuwah's counsel is to have your eyes open. And we were just reading how he was going to close the eyes, put a spirit of deep sleep, a coma, anesthetized. Give them confusion where they can't regard. So the idea here is to not just take the definition that you find in a dictionary or concordance, but to try to read the letters and use the letters compared to other words that are spelled with the same letters and appropriated in the same style. So if, if in the alphabet sequence, noon follows mem, mem is a water, and noon is, they say, a fish that jumps out of the water, lives in the water and jumps out of the water, while a womb is a mem, and the baby that is born in the womb or nurtured and developed in the womb then comes out of the womb at, on the birthday, same picture. So if pay noon is the word for my face, pe nun yod, pe nun yod mem, my face is also then, well, the noon is in the mouth and comes out of the mouth. Well, that's now associating the pe to the mem and saying, well, there's something about that, that which is in your mouth that comes out of your mouth. And then there's that, I believe it's a proverb that says, the things that you harbor in your heart are expressed through, through the fruit of your mouth. 
just like a picture of the psalmic being a tree bearing fruit according to where it's rooted. And psalmic is rooted in noon that gets its water from mem. And so I'm taking the alphabetic sequence compared to the spelling of words and associating them and overlaying them in order to come up with these definitions. So these things that I'm saying, say those are the, that I've defined them or I've translated the Eryctology method is not just looking at the dictionary or looking at 80 different translations that you might find online because I can't necessarily assume that any of the previous translators have done this task. And I actually tried to document one time how many considerations do I actually look at. I just gave you a definition of a few. Look in the dictionary, look at the standard way it's translated, look at the root word with prefixes and suffixes, dropping in yods and vavs, looking at appropriating different considerations of the Mishkan, the Moedim, Yeshua, and dropping them into the letter values. Right there is a, a number of different ways. And then looking at other spellings of words and taking this spelling of words like Mem Nun and Pe Nun and overlying them and say, well, just what is the Nun coming out of? The mouth, the womb, and so what does that mean? And to correlate that to Yeshua's own personal life as the fractal main pattern, like the DNA code, is Yeshua's life in the gospel. So anybody that has no regard of Yeshua, and from what I know, there's plenty of Jewish people who do regard that Yeshua is the Messiah. But by and large, the standardized basic premise, from what I understand of rabbinical Judaism, is that they think that the Jesus Christ guy that lived 2,000 years ago is an infidel, a heretic, a bastard who is right now burning in hell in excrement. That's what I've heard they say about him. And so they have no regard, are not going to tell his story, do not suggest that their people even read the gospel, and so the Jews have no access to these words that I'm saying. So you're not going to be able to go back to Jewish people who have studied the scripture, studied the Torah, the Tanakh, scholars, sages, wise men who dig through this and figure it out like crazy, if they disregard Yeshua completely, they're not going to come up with the same way of identifying what these words mean. Even so, the Christians for the last 2,000 years have considered the Moedim, the festivals, as listed in Leviticus 23, which includes the Sabbath day, to be, as Constantine said in quotes, the detestable practices of the Jews. And as a matter of fact, there's a certain code of, of, of understanding that they came up with. One particular man, I can't remember his name, but he says, okay, if the Jews rest, we're going to work. If they work, we're going to rest to prove we're not Jews. If the Jews fast, we will feast. And if we feast, or if they feast, then we're going to fast. And so the Christian, you might say, way that they live out their doctrines, the, the Christian custom is sometimes only derived by being opposite of what the Torah says, very specifically opposite. In which case, you can't look to them to find a true definition of words or true understanding of what Yahweh said. You're just not going to find it there. And you could say, well, I'm not accusing them. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. Yahweh says, return to my words and regard what I say. And if they, whoever they is, whether it's uh, an institution of learning, whether it's an ecclesiastical in institution of the, of the church or scientists or the politics, or whoever, if they say, hey, we have nothing to do with that, it's like, Thank you for identifying yourself. I'm not accusing. I'm listening to what they say. And when Yahweh says, if they speak not according to the Torah and the testimony, there's no light in them. That's the standard. That's the bottom line. We did a video about that. So they're maybe you'll notice. Excuse me? They're conjunctioned. They're conjunctionists? They've conjunctioned. Got, yeah, I know. You're talking about the calendar. <laughs> right, getting into that. Anyway, my, what I'm saying is that if you look at these videos that we've done in sequence, this is building. Each one of these videos that we're making is building upon the last one to get to a point. And we're trying to say, well, the, the pinnacle, which is actually the deepest part, oh, the profundity, the incredible deep study, that's this literally what this word means, the first word of uh, verse 15. But it says, woe to those who try to hide in depths. Does it really mean woe to those who try to hide in depths? Or is it saying, oh, the incredible depth, the deep study of Yahweh? This says, woe to those who try to hide in depths to conceal counsel from Yahweh. What's the true definition of this verse? There's numerous different ways to translate these verses. I am simply and only writing down the words in Hebrew, looking at the dictionary, writing down the definition, looking at the meaning of the, of the various letters, and then 
trying to wrap my mind around it without regarding somebody else's translation. I'm looking at the standardized definition in the dictionary, but then I found Ernest Klein's etymological dictionary may be different than what you'll find online, might be different than what you'll find in Strong's Concordance. How many different sources are you going to look at? So I'm looking at the Mishkan pattern, which includes the Moedim, the seven days of creation, the design of the tabernacle itself, Yeshua speaking the Beatitudes, the seven churches in Revelation, and numerous other, there's like five, 500 places that I found this Mishkan pattern in Scripture. In which case you can say, well, if this Memnun rep is, is representative of the laver, is representative of Shavuot, well, Shavuot is counting 50 days, and then the, the birthday, like 50 years, and then the Jubilee, and if it's 50 years, and then Bikarim, and it's like, well, okay, then there's this model of conception, pregnancy, and birth. And that's the model that you can appropriate. And any time I see a mem noon, then, mem or noon, I can plug into what the meaning of that word is in that, from that verse into that word in this context. And it's like, well, that's what this study is all about. And then we get down to verse 16. Here's the problem that verse 15 seems to set up. It's the backbone of wise counsel is understanding the resurrection. So I'm saying that the letter Zadi represents the resurrection of Yeshua from the grave, which would be what's known as Resurrection Day, which is tomorrow, a few hours from now. See, he didn't raise Easter morning. He was in the grave three days and three nights, which means from Wednesday night, Thursday morning, Thursday night, Friday morning, Friday night, Saturday morning, that's three days and three nights. So sometime around the end of the daylight hours of Saturday, and I know some people don't like using the names of the days of the week, but in many different languages, like Sabado in Spanish is Saturday, and it's Shabbat, Shabbat, that's where it comes from. So the seventh day, calling it Saturday for the sake of reference so we can communicate without people getting too hot under the collar, Saturday night, if he stayed in the grave Saturday night, it would have been four nights and three days. And it, it wasn't. It was three days and three nights. So that means he was out of the grave. Whether the Romans actually saw him come out of the grave or whether he just kind of went through the tomb, nevertheless, an angel came and rolled back the stone that the Romans, from what I understand, I saw a picture of this on the internet. They had this big round stone that might have weighed, a, do you know, a, a ton or two? Big heavy stone, kind of thick maybe six feet in diameter or something, they would roll in this track in front of the tomb, and then they had a steel bar with a whole core hole drilled through the stone, and the Romans would drive this steel wedge, uh, this, this it, through the, uh, like, a, like a nail of a kind of peg, through the stone and into the face of the rock. It, that was the seal, and you couldn't move this thing. You couldn't dislodge it. And for the angel to just shear that thing off, roll the stone away, and he's not in the tomb. So when the disciples and the women came to the tomb Sunday morning, he was already gone. He didn't rise Sunday morning. My point is, the Zadi lines up in the Mishkan with the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was Aaron's rod that budded. He had a dead stick, and the story is in Exodus, where they were trying to decide who was going to be the chief priest. And uh, Yahuwah said to uh, well, Moshe said something about Aaron because Yahweh had said so, and then some other people were saying, hey, that's, what's the word, nepotism. You know, you're just having your brother with you rule the country, and that's no fair. And he said, okay, have all the leaders, the princes, bring their staffs, dead sticks, dead sticks. Just, okay, it's a dead stick. And, and sit it there, and overnight, Aaron's budded. It put out leaf, bud, flower, the, the blossom, and fruit, almond. And the word almond is shinkuf dalit, which is shakad, which means also industrious, diligent, and zealous, jealous. It's like, man, he's fired up, smoking. That word like with a locomotive, ayin shinun, it's the same uh, synonymous word. The, the point is, he indicated that Aaron was to be the high priest because his rod budded overnight and nobody else did. And it's like, okay, this is, for, this is what we would call you know, divine revelation. Well, for Yeshua to pop out of the grave, though he was dead, is a model of the exact same meaning, the message. So the Zadi is a sprout, like in springtime, where that which looked dead, dormant trees, will come back to life. Oh, hey, look, there it is. And he even said, you know, the story, the parable of the fig tree, the mishle, the analogy, metaphor, where 
the ends of the branches get tender and they start putting off leaves, but that's a, a living tree which is dormant. Aaron's rod was a dead stick. Yeshua was dead, dead, dead. Came back to life, so that's the sprout of Zadi. So if the Jews don't regard Yeshua as coming back to life, none of them are going to regard the letter Zadi as being a pictograph of the resurrection. It just ain't going to happen. So you're not going to hear this story from any Jewish person that knows the Hebrew alphabet. They'll think that this is absolute heresy. But for me to say it lines up with the Sabbath day, the Zion and the Zadi, according to the Mishkan Pattern Code, both line up with the Sabbath day, and it lines up with Shemini Atzeret, well, the Christians have no part of that, because Sunday is the proof that their voice is more authoritative than the written scripture. When, when the Romans said, we're going to change the day from Saturday to Sunday, uh, supposedly to honor the fact that Jesus rose from the dead Sunday morning, which he didn't, as we just said, they were saying it's also to prove that our voice, our voice, the Roman Catholic Church, our voice takes priority over that which was written in the finger of Yahweh on tables of stone and that which his own voice spoke from the top of Mount Sinai. Talk about presumption. And the Catholics even say, I heard him say it on the radio, I'm not making this up, they said any Protestant who regards, keeps, observes Sunday as the holy day bows the knee to the Pope and they're too stupid to know what they're doing because their own scripture says it should be the seventh day and we changed it to the first. Now, you don't have to believe that, but that's recorded history. And if you don't like it, don't take it up with me. Take it up with the history books and the Roman Catholic Church. Now, maybe the Catholics don't even know that. I'm not suggesting they do, but that's why we're making these videos. It's in their catechism. It's in their catechism. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. The Orthodox <clears throat> Church orthodox we talked about that in the previous video that means true right accurate and they say hey even the catholics went wayward and punk and veered off the track but boy the greek orthodox the roman orthodox romanian orthodox russian orthodox boy they're holding it to the law no they're not they're keeping sunday as the regard instead of the seventh day shabbat why they're off track like it or not that's what the words say so for me to even say these words is pure heresy as far as they're concerned, and according to the Spanish Inquisition, people saying that this kind of thing would, would suffer some uh, not so nice consequences. I understand the risk of saying these words of truth, but Yahweh is my Elohim, and we have nothing to fear if we're his people. So, it's time for the truth to be spoken. The sounding of the shofar. He talks to Israel about blowing the silver trumpet and blowing the shofar. To have these two voices is to bring his words like the noon in the Samic. The, 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 the structure, the spelling of words, and the noon is the meaning of the words. Yeshua lifted up. Moshe lifting up the serpent in the wilderness, and all who got bit by the vipers would look at it and would be healed. So there's something about looking at what he gave us to recover. Recover sanity, recover health, recover our nation, recover the, the earth. Anyway, the, so the backbone of wise counsel, ayin, zadi, hey, and again the letter hey, like the wing on the nun zadi here, is that which is the, hey is a prefix, means the, means it's coming from heaven to the word, and then as the word expresses, the hey is a, the, su the, the prefix and the suffix, the hey is a suffix, is that, that which the word speaks to you. So for me to say ayin, zadi, hey, is eyeball, ayin, comprehend, understand, weigh, balance, and perceive what the zadi says, hey, uh, so it's ayin, zadi, hey, well that's the word etzah, simply means take counsel, but as I just said, it means much more, it, because the word ayin, literally the same name as the letter ayin, means to weigh carefully, balance exactly, ponder, consider, look, measure, calculate, wrap your mind and everything you've got to figure this thing out, and yet I had somebody who was prophetic tell me once, because they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they said, to think is carnal. Don't think. <laughs> but yet Yahweh, the word bet yod noon means to ponder, think, look well to, balance, compare this to that. And the word shakil is to be kind, cunning and wise and be able to fit that together. When you're building a car, 
you better use your head or you better get out of the shop. You're going to lose some fingers and the car won't run. It'll fall apart down the road. You better think. Yahweh built the human mind to think and the human hands to express what the thoughts are and the mouth to project what the thoughts are going. He built the body in, a, in a, an incredible way. We could go on about that, but I'm just trying to say there's more to that subject that you'll find as you investigate words, like the word het shin bet, kashav, which we will, I think is one of the words in here that, uh, yes, it's later, it, it means to arithmetic, an ingenious device. It's like the word abacus. It means to be able to create an invoice or to calculate. And it also has to do with a band or a girdle. So in Revelation, I think it's chapter 3, where or perhaps two. Anyway, John sees Yeshua, and he's got he's wearing this white robe, and he's got eyes like fire, and head like wool, and his feet like burnished brass in a fire glowing, and he's got this golden band around his chest. And it's like, what's that supposed to mean? A golden band around his chest? It's the word hetching bet. This ingenious work, which which is the Aleph bet. It's his Torah. It's the way everything fits together. So, what he's wearing even is a message, it's a symbol, it's, it's like being able to, can we read what these pictures are? Everything about this language is pictographic. So to understand the resurrection is the ayin, the zadi, hey. That's where I come up with this. The thing that was hidden, the incredible deep study, the profundity of Yahweh, the thing that was hidden is the backbone of wise counsel, understanding the resurrection. That's what I see as the translation of this word. And then, you, then it goes on to say, it happened as a theater of darkness, stage as a contradiction, contrary of doing what he told them. What does that mean? Yeshua could only be Mashiach if he came embodying the 22 letters, doing exactly what Abba Yahweh had said. And even Yeshua said, I only do what I see the Father doing, say what I hear him saying. Well, if he's going to be the Mashiach, the Messiah of Israel, any good Jew, any Sadducee or Pharisee or even political leader of theirs would have to validate him. They couldn't look at him keeping the words of the Torah and say, the guy's an infidel. So somehow the trick that Yahweh had to pull, if it was written that he had to be, hey, Vav, Zion, hey, behold, this man put to the weapon and then Chet put into a tomb and tipped the round rock rolled in front and Yod sealed with the Roman pin, how is he going to be put to death? That has to be part of the script. How and why is a different part, which we'll get to in a moment, but how is he going to do that? He can only come as the Word made flesh, the Torah in human form, incarnate. He can only do what he is supposed to do, and yet the people who are more diligent than anybody to regard what he said are going to have to consider him an infidel and put him to death. It's staged as a theater of darkness, and somehow the contradiction, how is Yahweh going to pull this off? How's he going to take his most diligent servants, those who supposedly that they think from their heart and mind and their zeal, are worshiping Yahweh, regarding every letter of his word, and yet they have to take the manifestation of the word and kill it. Why? That's what it says here. Contrary of doing what he told them, who then can show us and who can give us this knowledge? And the way to read those two words there is strong-mindedly, eruditely put explanation on exhibition. Well, I contend that the explanation on exhibition is looking at the 22 letters of the Hebrew language as pictures. It'll tell the story, which is what this is trying to do. So, verse 16. Reverse it. That's what the word says here. The first word of verse 16 here says, And you said, not so! If you look at the words in Hebrew, it literally means reverse it. Turn it around contrary-wise. If something so serious, so severe as the crucifixion of Yeshua a subject of such frenzy, that of materializing the imaginary closely guarded secret. That's the meaning of the letters of the Aleph Bet. Messenger of revolution. That's the Messiah, the messenger of revolution, how to come there and turn everything around. Not only that the, as the Jews were hoping and expecting to turn them free of the Roman tyranny, the oppressive of, of the regime of the, of the Caesar, the, the Zadi Resh, but also to, to make a revolution of the just the trouble that Adam got us into from all the way back there in the Garden of Eden. Then this next, the third, fourth word, the hinge upon which pivots, the most ingenious plan, the greatest calculated arithmetic invention ever. 
That's the word Ketshin shin bet. It must match exactly what he said, as Yeshua did, and fit precisely according to what he said to do, that's the Torah, which would provoke no anger or fury or contest of aggravation. But even so, its function by design is to manufacture a form which speaks whatever is truly of Creator, but he had to do it in such a way that it is not observed, not recognized, and can't be distinguished. So this problem of why did Yeshua come down here kind of in disguise, and he told his disciples, hey, don't tell anybody who I am, had to be part of the plan. The word bet gimel dalit means in disguise, camouflage, to deceive, betray, beguiled. It's like, what, is, what I'm saying is that this is like just mind-blowing, but the same message that's written in the alphabetic letters in their natural sequence, Aleph, Bet Gimel Dalet, Hevav Zion, Het Tet Yod, Kaf Lamed, Memnun, Samakai and Pei, Zadi, Kuf, Reshing Tav, I, I pose those according to sequences, how they fit within the pattern, just for what it's worth, had to fit the description of what Yeshua, how he lived out his life, and it happens to fit exactly what verse 16 is talking about. And it has to do with the legal problem of how Yahweh is going to send down this word made flesh who had to do everything right, and yet the most zealous of those who are watching for what's doing right can't see it, flip it upside down, and have to put him to death because that's what the plan said. What a puzzle! Going on to verse 17. And that first there, that, that first word in 17 is. Where did I. 1,000 will flee from the shout of one, but I uh, have here that it, uh, the word is hello. No, I'm on You're in 30. The, I'm on the yeah, wrong verse. That's why. 20, 29. 17. Is it not yet a very little while? Is it, Right. So we're, the way that I'm just trying to say that where they get this from, it's spelled hey, lamed, vav, aleph, ayin, vav, dalit. And it's translated here, 70, behold, in just a little while. And yet, hey, Lamed Vav Aleph is where we get the word hello, and then Ayin Vav Dalit is that word again and again, repeatedly and forcefully. But it's also Ayin Dalit means until or while. So they say, well, we're going to translate this behold, <laughs> hello. That's not the word behold. The word behold is Hana. Sometimes they'll tell you that the word behold is Hineni, but the word Hineni is translated here I am. Hmm. It's not behold. So what I'm saying is, I don't trust the English of Stones to Knock. They mess around with the translation. It's not just KJV or NIV. It's these guys too. The only way to know what it says is to look at this. Hello, I Vav Dalit. So I Vav Dalit is the word for witness and testimony. And it also means again and again, repeatedly, repeatedly and forcefully, never changing. So I'm saying what these first two words mean is, Hello, it must always be the same witness. Never change. And then you get this next word, mem I and tet, which is the word ma'ot. You get the word iota. Well, not one iota, or the moat in his eye. That's the word moat, and it means the smallest little detail. And then you get mem zion I and resh, which is actually in miniature. And then veshuv, vav shin bet. And then, la bonon, lamed bet nun vav nun. So here we have, hello, it must always be the same witness, never change. Even the smallest detail, the tiniest miniature, it repeats and builds, compounds itself. He's talking about a fractal pattern. The fractal pattern, that's the definition like DNA. And the very next word means, according to the likeness of, high word, determining particle, that's DNA which is a built-in, like a software program by which things replicate. And then the next word, and that likeness of programmed equation, it's a genetic code, is according to, the next word, yod ayin resh. Now that word yod ayin resh means roused awake, investigate, enemy, watchful, bared, exposed, blind, honeycomb, forest, silv silviculture, which is forestry, difficult to understand. The word hey ayin resh hey, so now we take the word yod ayin resh and say let's look at with putting in different prefixes and suffixes and put the yod and the vav in there and let's see how what this word means. How do you ayin the resh? How do you understand what resh means? Well, resh is a picture of Yeshua after he sprouted back to life and rose up under the resh status, which is like this, this heavenly man rather than the earthly man of the vav, the ben Yosef, and he's coming back at ben David. So these two letters, vav and resh, 
put Vav and Resh together, it's this word light. So when he says, let there be light, Isla Vav Resh, he says, here's the plan for a Vav man to become Resh man. And so Yeshua had to chart the course. He had to run the gamut. He had to come down here on earth as a man to drop down to the depth of Mem and then tweak, change something at the Mem, which we'll get to in a minute, and then come back out noon Samakai and pay Zadi. Koof, Resh, there he is. Sheen, woohoo, spectacular. Tov, just like he said, it worked. So Yeshua had to put this plan into a formula and said, now I got to run it. I got to do that. What do you call it? With that, that first run, the prototype run? Is there a word for that? The maiden voyage? Those are all good, good, good. So Yeshua for... says, okay, this is the plan. I think it's going to work. I know it's going to work because I invented the plan and whatever Yahweh says and does, gets it. but I'm going to run it first. And I'm going to prove that a human being can come to the face of the earth, die, be thrown down into the depths of the grave, but then somehow be reborn and shoot back out the other side under this Resh status unto eternity dwelling with El Shaddai. That's Kuf, Resh, Sheen, Tav. And so Yeshua said, I'm going to do it first. I'm going to be the guy that makes this happen. That's what he did. But how did he do it? Why did he do it? He had to do it because he invented it. Shouldn't he have been able to vent a different thing? What if he said, look at Adam ate the forbidden fruit, but if you guys pick up a shofar and go, da -da -da, hey, you're forgiven of your sins. Woohoo, wouldn't that be wonderful? Just blow the shofar and all your sins are forgiven. He didn't have to come and die. He didn't have to come and die. But he chose to come down as a human, going to the depth of a human having lost his life, lost his soul, lost his mind, lost his heart, somewhere down at the bottom of Mem. Frank Seekins, you know, says Mem is chaos. There's something about chaos which is a dismantling, a fragmenting, a turning into nothingness. And from that nothingness, he takes the elements and he rebuilds them into new. A butterfly, you got a caterpillar walking along, chewing on leaves, and it's ingesting. Whatever it ingests, it then spins a, a chrysalis, goes inside, and the whole thing turns into a slurry. Down. The head doesn't become the head and the feet become the feet of the butterfly. The whole thing turns into a slurry and it recomposes into a butterfly with wings and comes out with one of those curly things that, you know, they stick into the, uh, whatever, there's a word for that, I forget what they're called. Anyway, they suck the nectar out of the flowers. It's a picture of what's going to happen to us. We sit here eating our vegetables, but one of these days we'll be sucking the nectar out of the flowers and flying like a cloud, like a butterfly. Proboscis. A what? Proboscis. A proboscis. Whoa, you're smart. How did you learn that word? Proboscis. <laughs> Whoa, okay. Anyway, let's get on. The iron, uh, so the, this word yod, iron, resh. Yod is a hand, the creator's hand. So the powerful, effective hand of the potter. As we were just reading in here, something about... Can the pot say to the potter, you don't know what I'm doing? It's like everything's just a product of his hands. Of course he knows. So the yod is the powerful, effective hand of the potter. He will make it happen. It's the first person or the, the third person prefix. It means he will projecting into the future. Uh, ayin lines up with the day of Yom Kippur, according to the Moed pattern of the Mishkan. And it means to atone for or balance the scales of justice. Weigh carefully, look carefully like the judge watching over and saying, is this fair measure? You, what a man does is going to come back to him. If you do this, you get the blessing. You do that to get the curse. Everything has to be eyeballed for exactly just right. Yahweh's throne is balanced on mishvat. I mean, picture a ball, like a bowling ball, and you put a piece of plywood on Now, you stick a chair on top of that and sit in it. Mm -hmm. That's Yahweh's throne poised on mishvat. Mm -hmm. Perfect balance. A man's way will re be returned on his own head. There's these pictures that are in the Hebrew. And then Resh, victorious, exalted champion, the butterfly mode. So you could say this way to read Yodai and Resh is he will personally engage the dilemma. That's Yeshua coming down into man's sinful depravity nature. Correct it and come out the other side supreme and masterful. That's exactly what you can read in Yodai and Resh according to reading the alphabetic sequence. And how did he do it? Or what did he do? Because it's a fractal image, it's got to be the story that whatever he wants us to know has got to be also embedded within the alphabet itself. So if the alphabet contains a code by which you can read the alphabet. It's a self-embedded code as a fractal model within the model itself. And then the last one is that same word, Cheshav again. Incredible plan, ingenious device, calculated to every consideration of regard. Proof that what I'm telling you 
is exactly what these words are talking about, which is the understanding of the Pelu letters according to the Nishkan pattern with I and Dalit, I and Tav. I and Dalit, understand the door. Yeshua claimed to be the door. I and Tav, know the meaning of the letters. Tav, the sign of each letter. So without Yeshua, you can't do this. Without the meaning of the Hebrew letters according to the Moed, the Moedim of Leviticus 23, which the Christian church denies, you can't do this. You have to have two eyes, the Dalit and the Tav. The two-eyed binocular, look, it. there's iron, two eyes, a Dalit and a Tav, Dalit Tav, they're, they're just turning the saber-toothed tiger into a face, a caricature of iron Dalit, iron Tav. The point is, you get to verse 18, Shema, here, listen up, in that day, the silent, unintelligible, rational explanation, the reason for my words to be written in such a manner the Hebrew alphabet, the power behind the script is fertility in the goblet. Now, Yosef, Joseph, Jacob's 11th son, the firstborn of Rachel, the word Joseph means goblet. It also means threshold. It also means he will accumulate. It also means he will bring to an end. So the word Yom Suf, Sea of Reeds, the word reed is a straw that sucks up. It's where we get the word sofa to sit in it and it pulls everything out of your pockets and out of your bowl of popcorn and your, you know, everything falls into the cushions of the sofa. Same exact word. Joseph's job when he was vizier of Egypt was that he accumulated all the wealth, he accumulated all the food, people come to his threshold and he would dispense to them and remember he had this goblet that he put in Benjamin's sack as a way of, it, it, the reason, don't you know I divine, I, I interpret mysteries by these things, and his name in Egypt was Zafnath Paneach, <laughs> diviner of mysteries, the seer of the unseen. Oh, how did he do that? That's the study I wrote up in the uh, Smilodon book is that I think he knew how to understand Hebrew spelling, which means did the spelling of the Hebrew language exist before? Did Moshe write it down? That's another part of the study, but the interesting thing is Daniel knew how to read this stuff, Moshe knew how to read this stuff, Yosef knew how to read this stuff, David knew how to read this stuff, and as Ehud Benai, the Israeli folk singer said, it says, speak the language of the Hebrew man. You're in good company. Yeshua knew how to write this and read this stuff. Learn Hebrew. It'll do you well. A hmm. little bit more here. The reason for my words to be written in such a manner, the power behind the script, fertility in the goblet, emerges from deep, dark obscurity, from ignorant illiteracy. Having been kept on reserve, restrained, and withheld from academic scholarship, from eyes who deliberate meticulous, pedantic evaluation, the blind here are given sight, exposed and incited to activity. Exhibition is made, proving reason for fear and reverence. Yahweh himself in these very words that he gave to Isaiah is telling us that here, the occasion of coming back to these words, he is held from the scholars of the Bible, of the scriptures, of literature for thousands of years until here and now so that the blind can see and that all of us, the remnant of Israel, the, who want to be his Zion, his navy of navigating his words, are incited to activity at this exposure. Hmm. I'm not making this up. It's right here in these words. But you can only see it if you look at the words according to Ayin Dalet Ayin Tov. Verse 19, then continuing on, they who comprehend the significance that's us. That's who you who are taking the time to sit here and listen to hour upon hour of these videos. They respond with a burden of occupation, singing and humble. <coughs> That's the word spelled ayin nun hey, which is the word in Isaiah 58 for those who respond to Yom Kippur by taking on this affliction, this burden, this occupation, this fasting, however you want to translate the word. That's the word, and it means to respond in humility of Oh boy, what are we going to do about this? Let's do what he said. Let's figure out what he said. Let's take the time to study. Let's get together and mm -hmm. attend mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. In singing. That's the word. In the condition of entering the personal space of what Yahweh held as his own unfurled. That's a picture of the letter bet. The letter bet is furled is just like the proboscis. Uh. <laughs> 
<laughs> Where'd you come up with that? <laughs> <laughs> the letter bet is a unfolded <laughs> probiscus. <laughs> What Yahweh held as his own, the curl of the bet, of the design of a tent, is called my father's house. This was Yahweh's personal stuff that he kept secret from all the smart guys over the centuries, over the millennia. And then here it is, he's opening it up and saying here, and he's making it what was private, he's making public. That's exactly what this word is saying. Hmm. What Yahweh held as his own, he unfurls it and allows those who would regard his words and take in upon them I and noon hay to be humbled and afflicted, singing and rejoices and responding. Come on in. The next word says simply rejoicing. And next word, yearning to be the one who fulfills my desire. We have the shot right now to be the chafatzi of Yahweh, the one, the generation to, that fulfills the reason that humans walk the face of the earth, the reason that Yeshua came went to the cross, died, went to the depths of Mem. It says, Peter, I believe, tells us that he went to the, to hell, to Hades, to Gehenna. Mm. He went down to Sheol, to somewhere, to the place where the dead spirits go. And as one person said, he, he grabbed the, the pitchfork out of the devil and shoved it in his own rear end, took the keys of the kingdom and climbed back out to release the captives. And it's like, well, something like that. Is that that's kind of a cartoon story of what he did. But I think he did something else, which has to do with what's in the letters. But nevertheless, Yeshua went down through death as a human, in the human condition, in order to tweak, change something at the mem level, to modify at the quantum physics level. Hmm. Smaller than electrons and protons, smaller than quarks, down to the wiggling strings, the string theory being the Hebrew Aleph Bet, the string of massless information, Aleph through Tav, he did something there. Well, he fulfilled it as the route, the course, the, the map, step by step, but something's going on in this Hebrew language which explains why he had to come and die and then resurrect out the other side and go, woohoo, see, it works, I did it, told you. And that's what Isaiah 29, 19 is talking about. And then he goes on to say, man, in his fullness of a potential as originally envisioned, that's the resh man. All this is to see who wants to be resh man, who wants to be the har hey resh of Zion, the ones who listen to Yahweh's commands and do them. Being the betrothed, that's the next word, Israel, that's kadosh Israel, whom he exalts over in joy and gladness, in a circle of sameness. Like that train pulling the rocks. These are not light matters. These are rocks. This is not a matter of playing chess and who's the good guys, the white guys, the black guys. Whatever. That's the wrong game. <laughs> this is Yahweh's train filling the temple mm -hmm. with Tsar. Zadi Resh. It's not Caesar, Kaiser, Tsar. It's the rocks of his. Remember, it's, it's his Zadi Resh, Tsar, the resurrected Resh man bringing back the regard of his Torah so that we can be the epitome of the people that he's always envisioned and wanted. Mm -hmm. That's Zadi Resh, whom he exults over because Zadi, Zadi Yod is also this bird putting out a wing. That's the butterfly taking flight. It's the mm -hmm. sun coming up over the horizon and brilliant shining. Verse 20, my hand raised an oath, Kaf Yod, I will nullify, bring to an end, causing them to tremble, the ruthless, cruel, terrible, tyrannical, though admired and adored, that celebrity mm. of all varieties of various peoples, not just the Americans and the British or the Romans, it's everybody else as well. Yahweh is saying, at this time, I swear I raise my hand that all those guys are going down and terminate every mocking, scorning, ignorant jerk who doesn't regard the eloquence of speech. Hmm. And I'm using words that are definitions of the words and letters that are in these very words. And make known by cutting them down by misfortune, the fakes, the foreigners who are not my people. Hmm. Everyone who is zealous about vigorous manliness, getting success by deceit, fraud, wickedness, reveling in sorrows. Sorrows, like Mr. Uh, what's his name? George Soros? <laughs> <laughs> oh. This literally means he's going to cut down by misfortune everyone who is zealous about vigorous manliness. The resh man status is being vigorous about Yahuwah's word and being his people. It's not about our earthly vigorous manliness of doing deceit, fraud, and wickedness and reveling and causing everybody else sorrow. He says, attend to, not contend upon, but attend to the widows and the orphans and the ones who were pushed down in life. 
Verse 21, sinners that I have cleansed, purified, disinfected, brought into my favor. Where'd that come from? How did he do that? Because we're talking about being down in Mem. Mem comes right out of previously Lamed, then Kaf, then Yod, then Tet, then Chet. And the word that's spelled Chet, Tet, Yod literally means my sin, I incurred guilt, my sin offering. Hmm. So for Yeshua being the hey, hey look, the Vav man who was put to the weapon Zion and put into the tomb, Chet, and the round rock Tet rolled in front and Yod sealed, he incurred the weapon as my sin sacrifice because the word Chet, Tet, Aleph means my sin sacrifice that incurs my guilt. The Yod suffix means it's mine. He incurred my guilt so that I could be cleansed, so that I can find favor. And this word here that I have, that him saying that I have cleansed, purified, disinfected, brought into my favor, is the word that's Mem Chet Tet Yod. That's if you read it according to what the letters mean and the words that are spelled in the natural sequence. Man, I will not, I will be silent, not complain, and imitate, be similar. That's the word Chet Kuf. Het kuf is the word commander law. As per the terms and stipulations as agreed upon. That's the Torah, which is what the het kuf is. And vigorously make an issue out of arguing and reproving, preach it. If you hadn't noticed, that's what we're doing by these videos. We're trying to fulfill intentionally Isaiah 29, 21. In the public forum, in the gates, that's Facebook. <laughs> that's this video of Mountain Air 7. That's exactly... We've been doing this before I even read this. But Yahweh prophesied here in the public forum, in the gates, deliberate hard questions and difficult understandings against severe reluctance, extend the life preserver, throw the net into the empty void of confusion. That's the public media. We're doing this. This is happening real time, present tense. You're the witness of it. As an offer of salvation, rescue under the righteous, virtuous correctness. Verse 22, absolutely of a truth, thus declares Yahweh toward the house of Jacob, Jacob, those in my house domesticated by my rules who would prevail, because remember the word Jacob, Jacob means to rise up to the third dimension over the obstacles in the second dimension, that's cubed, that's to the third dimension, flying, soaring over to prevail, superseding the circumstances. That one who, which, walks straight, that's the word I, Aleph Sheen Resh, authentic, valid, and praiseworthy, is redeemed, delivered, ransomed. This is proof of Yahweh saving us, rescuing us from anything our enemies want to devise against us. Every machination, every machine, every tool that they invent is going to come down on their own head. Aleph Tov, in that I have exempted them, given them exception, they being cleansed and purified, not now, put to shame or disappointed, the house of Yaakov that wants to walk in his ways, he will rise up, prevail, receive his reward as promised. That's exactly what the word Jacob means. As a wake follows a ship. Yahweh promised it, it's a reality, it's going to happen, it will manifest. Not now, his face pallid or pale, his face exposed and made a spectacle, like what the Nazis did to the Jews during the Holocaust. Verse 23, because healthy is he, fat, shapely, recovered, my child. I claim him as a matter of fact, proactively by my own hand. I approach to draw him near, I reach out to him, my own hand. He will kiddush it, he will make my name appreciable with extreme reverence of my ways. That's what we're talking about. And then, that consecration of it, my Shem, which he does, we're proclaiming the Shem of Yahweh. Him actually making Kiddush of the Kadosh, Aleph Tov is fitting and proper, proper, he will rise up, he will ayin kuf bet. And the El He of Israel, he will cause them to tremble. He will give them something to admire and adore. He's going to turn the regard of celebrity around and the people of Israel who regard the Shem of Yahweh and make it Kadosh, everybody else is going to go, yeah, and, and give great reverence to that. Last verse. He knows it. Misdirected, deceived, disappointed, lost, wandering, staggering, the last 2,000, 3,000 years. The whole nine yards, the expanse, wind blown all to heck. Understandable, but now grumblers and container, uh, complainers can learn. Why? Because the deaf can hear and the blind will see. That's the Paleo Hebrew. It's his words made perfectly clear, pictographic, telling the story of do justice and righteousness, peace, truth, mercy, 
they can take hold, they can blaze up like a fire, can capture the teaching like being impregnated, and that last word, yod, vav yod, aleph mem resh, goes back to the very first word in 13, which is vayamer. To grab a hold, connect to the umbilical cord of the aleph source by which to succeed victoriously as the resh man, because that's what he said as the emperor without fail. Hear, believe, and engage in doing so. Now, what were you going to say about that? <laughs> well, I was going to say that that last verse, when will that happen? They, in, in my English translation, they that err in spirit shall come to understanding. They that murmur shall learn instruction. How can that when happen? When will that happen? So if this is the end of the world, <clears throat> that can't happen. Time must go on. It and must. not just a week or two, or a little bit of time, a lengthy bit of time, because otherwise, what's he doing all this for? You think he brought us here just to, uh, okay, I guess time's up, it's all over. This is his game. Somebody else may try to wreck the world, but this world is Yahweh's program. And whatever he sees fit is going to happen. What do we have left in time? Oh, we got a few minutes. A few minutes. Okay, so my point is this. This just sets up what we had read goes into chapter 30, where verse 26 the light of the moon will be like the light of the sun. The light of the sun will be seven times as strong. Is that a, an event out in, the, in outer space here where there's solar flares? Now is that the light of the sliver moon? Be the light yeah, of the, the light sun? of the sliver moon will be seven times brighter. <laughs> and the full moon will be seven times brighter too. Oh, okay. But something's going to go on. It says, verse 25, on every high mountain, every exalted hill, there will be pools, rivers of water, rivulets of water, and on the day of great killing, when great ones fall, the light of the moon will be like the light of the sun, the light of the sun is seven times strong, like the light of seven days. Can you imagine the sun seven times brighter than it is? Hmm. I mean, what, it, 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 in Arizona, it gets to be 120. I mean, that's liable to be like 180. Hmm. I was in an attic once working, and it was 140. That's pretty rough. Hmm. Seven times on the day that Yahweh bandages the injury of his people and heals the wound of his blow. Wait a minute. If he's going to heal the wound of his people, then <laughs> Yahweh himself has punched his people for being such stupid jerks. <laughs> well, if he's going to heal it, then that's not the end of the world. Something mm -hmm. else is yet to happen that's in front of us. So if we a are sitting lot. here... A whole lot. If we're sitting here trying to read the alphabetic sequence as a prophecy, I think that where we're at is right around here, Zadi Kuf, similar to the resurrection and then the rising up of Yeshua. Something, if you could read the alphabetic letter sequence as a prophecy, when Yeshua came out of the grave, remember the letter right before the Zadi is the pay before that's the ayin. So something about understanding the mouth opening and resurrecting, Pezadi, is the open mouth. And Yeshua, when he gave the Sermon on the Mount, it said he went up onto the hill, seeing the multiplutes, and he sat down, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, well, the word literally is translated, he opened his mouth, is spelled Pezadi. So Pezadi is an open mouth. It's the grave that he was put into at the letter Chet, opens up, and it's, he sprouts out for the resurrection, Zadi, correlating to tonight's events. And then right after that, he hung around for 40 days. That would be the kuf status as he rose up into the air. This is the mushroom shape. He rises up into the clouds, and then the angel, the malak, said, hey, he's going to come back the same way. So something about kuf, the word kum or komi or kumi, like Isaiah 60, verse 1, kumi ori, arise, shine, your light has come. That's the kuf. So something about where we are right now, I can read as saying, the same way he rose up and said, I'm not going to leave you alone, I'm going to send you the Ruach, and then I'm going to come back, and it's like, okay, well, we're somehow in this place of his words opening up. That's the Paleo-Hebrew, our eyes opening up. That's the, 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 the seeing of the wise men and the understand, the seers, the prophets, everybody oh, being square shut. It, we're, it's opening up, and somehow this kuf for you. But sprouting. The word, sprouting. The word Jacob is yod ayin, kuf, bet. So Kuf, Ayan Kuf is the eyeball raising up. It's like somehow he said, as we read, the celebrities and politicians and military that are trying to squish everybody down, the banksters, somehow they're always going to turn the table and they're going to go, whoa, and they're going to give regard to anybody who has a regard of Yahweh. A regard of Yahweh. How do you do this great exploit, this, these feats of strength where you can regard Yahweh? 
sit down on the Shabbat. Keep the Moedim. Say the words, Yahuwah Elohi, Yahuwah Eloi. There's a band, a British rock band named Eloi. That's where they get that from. It was from the, the, the uh, book in the movie, Time Machine. The Eloi were the masters that lived above, and the Morlocks, the mortal ones locked in with death or the underneath the ground. Mm. But the Eloi were these ones. It means that's where you get the word Elohim. Right after the Kuf, Resh, Sheen, the spectacular Yeshua coming back as the exalted one. Sheen, Rosh is the word for prince. It's, well, Sara is prince, but Rosh is head, the exalted the way that it, it, and then there's the end. What I'm saying is that if this is where we are, it's not the end yet. And if it's Yeshua coming back, or if it's his words being comprehensible coming back, it's coming back to accomplish something. And that's where we're going to make another video where you're going to explain this. You want to give a little bit of a heads up on what that's about? Well, I just did. Well, um, a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> give, give them a teaser, a little trailer that they can well, preview. I wanted to look at the... Uh, Probably the greatest subject in all of the, the, the scriptures, the most um, covered subject, and that is when this verse 24 will be fulfilled. When will we come to understanding? When will they that err get understanding? When will they that murmur learn instruction? That's the purpose of Yahweh's kingdom and of his people. Israel was to teach his name and his ways to the nations, and they will. And so it's not when everybody's dead, it's no. when, and it's not in heaven, no. it's on the face no. of the earth. It's on earth. It's a time on the face of the earth when either yes. either it's Yeshua coming back yes. or his words manifest coming yes. back, Yahweh's name being made great, yes. and, it's a, and it's quite a length of time, maybe even the thousand year millennial reign right in front of us. I've found about 96 chapters and in that's the scriptures. What, and that's what we're going to do the next couple of videos about, right? Fred did the study. Come on, Fred. <laughs> Fred did the study, so he'll he'll take the reins of the uh, wow. microphone and explain this. Now, this is fascinating because it ties in with what you're doing. It's the preparation for what's around the next corner, yeah. and Great that's uh, it's vital because everything that's that's going to be done now before that time is going to determine kingdom status. That's right. Well, the thing about this, to just address one more last time, real quick about Yeshua coming here, going down to the depth of Mem. And I, and I made mention, just so people know what I'm saying, the same way that as, as a metaphor, a mishli, of the caterpillar going into the chrysalis, like Yeshua into the tomb, and decomposing its essence down to a slurry at the elemental level. No structure left, just a slurry. It's basically tohu ve bohu, which is to say formless and void. Well, formless and void can mean that something was destroyed, but in chunks, well, those, that's not formless, it's still got chunks. If you take elements and break them down to atoms, and atoms broken down to electrons and protons, positive charge, negative charge, that's the whole thing, that's still substance and form. But if you break down the electrons down to the quark level and break the quark level down to the massless string of information, the alphabet itself, well, that's without form, that's void of substance, but it still exists. So I'm suggesting that the words tohu ve bohu, formless and void, is that Yahweh already determined these 22 letters as that which are the elements by which to construct the universe, and then when he puts them into form, now we have this, now we have the word, now we have the scriptures, now we have Yeshua, but Yeshua went down to that quantum level and did something to affect that the fact that Adam brought us into a destructive state Yeshua made it possible by coming down there to put us back on the track of reconstructive state to become the Resh man as he intended. We're out of time, but that's why Yeshua came and died and resurrected. Stay tuned. This is getting good. Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.